Dr. Hacky Reitman. Welcome to another episode of Exploring Different Brains. Today we have returning one of my heroes, Ken Dykewald, Age Wave. He's got it all about how we age, we're positive, and we're moving forward. Ken, welcome. Great to be with you. The problem I ran into recently, I was giving up plenary talk down in Washington, D.C. at the, the first ever adult Down syndrome summit. And there was the reason it was the first ever was because their life expectancy in the 80s was 20s, now it's 60. So now there's dementia and everything else. And my friend Seth Keller, who's really a hero of mine, he's a co-chair of the National Task Force on Dementia and Alzheimer's. And uh, I went to his workshop there and I said, uh, you know, Seth, you know, I'm 68 and my Dad died of Alzheimer's and Parkinsonism, yeah, yeah. And I had 26 pro heavyweight fights, and I played rugby for 11 years, so I'm a poster boy to be at risk for, you know, dementia. And so, like, what do you do? How do you, you know, and, and really, we're not doing a whole lot different than we did when Alzheimer's was first discovered, in some ways, you know? So I was going to write a book. I was going to write a book on, like I wrote the Asper tools on Asperger's autism and neurodiversity because by the time I finished the book, I knew it was all the same stuff. So I started to write a book on almost Alzheimer's and dementia. Like I went for an evaluation. I got an MRI that was normal. I did this It was normal. Yeah. Surprisingly. <laughs> after all of no, that. it's great. And then the five-minute neuropsych test was okay, so I didn't do the big one. But... There's not a lot of hard, hard science as to tools that really work, which is what I'm into, other than socialization, uh, uh, things that make good sense, the socialization being far and away the most important, but strong social relationships. But it's, it's the other things that also make sense, that there's some proof with the exercise, the Mediterranean plan style diet, you know, uh, something I have a big problem with, getting rid of stress, which is big, 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 and mindfulness and, and all of that. But in the aging population, and you're one of the world's authorities, um, where does this enter into the calculus? It's a great question, uh, Hacky. So let me try to explain this in a way that's, that's it's digestible, because it's a little confusing. First, up until about 20 years ago, we didn't know much of anything about the aging brain or even the brain. You know, I remember people we referred to as being senile. It was just sort of a grab bag phrase. Oh, old people, they're senile. And we thought all old people get senile. It's just what happens with age. Even though the word Alzheimer's has been around longer than that, it's really only been about the last 10 years that we're starting to kind of map out how the aging brain works. And I would have to tell you, in a moment, I'll explain it in more detail, but in the last six years, I've been interacting with some of the world's great neuroscientists, and I hear them explain the healthy aging brain, the unhealthy aging brain, and they all, they're not even in agreement. So it's still kind of a fuzzy, funky zone. But here's generally the idea that I went to hear uh, about two months ago a speech by George Schultz in San Francisco. He's 97 years old. He was the secretary of everything under like every president going back to George Washington, I think. He was clear as a bell. It was unbelievable. He remembered every meeting, every situation with Nixon, Reagan, tear down that wall, water. He just, it, it was unbelievable. I felt like I was in a science fiction novel and I'm seeing a centenarian with a healthy brain. One of the things that people started realizing about 10, 15 years ago is that there is a healthy brain. And then there's a brain with disease. They're not the same. We can try to imagine a future where we live 80, 90, 100 years with healthy brains, healthy minds. There's somewhat the belief that there are, uh, there's cognitive impairment as we grow older. Let's think of that as sort of the big pool. Cognitive impairment may be you don't remember things quite as well. Um, 
your moods may roll around in the wrong direction, you don't sleep as well. Uh, during the day you're a little tired, at night you can't quite sleep, so there's this fuzzy zone. And we all struggle with cognitive impairment as we get older. I've heard some people say it's because of the loss of neurons as we age. I've heard other people say it's because we don't exercise and breathe enough and eat healthy diets. That I've heard a pretty good argument in the last few years that a lot of that cognitive impairment could be averted. Within cognitive impairment, there's what's called dementia. Turns out dementia is a bunch of different kinds of things. Robin Williams had what's called Lewy body dementia. It was a certain kind of dementia linked up with Parkinson's and depression. Then there's percussive dementia. The guys in the military that are hearing those bombs go off and it's rattling their, you know, their brains in their head. That's a percussive dementia. Then there's what's, what do we do about that? We're not sure. By the way, there's a lot of money now being spent in the military to try to figure out the brain. Then there's what's called vascular dementia. So we got arterial flow into the brain. You're a doc, I may get this wrong. But if those arteries get clogged, just like in your heart or anywhere else, blood's not gonna get into your brain. And therefore, we know a lot about how to have a healthier vascular system. It's keeping the proper body weight, eating a low-fat diet, uh, getting sufficient good 30 minutes a day of vigorous exercise. It's keeping yourself flexible, proper stress management and sleep. And by doing those kinds of things, you can probably prevent the vascular dementias. I've also seen, emerging out of Silicon Valley, lots of software companies coming forward saying that these are apps, whether it's Lumosity and there's others, that by utilizing them, you can actually trigger the brain to be more vibrant, more capable, just like exercising a muscle. So then we've got the long-lived person and we've got some cognitive change. I also want to point out that there are some people who are now suggesting that the mind gets better with age. There's what's called the happiness curve. The people at Stanford have come out with a lot of studies these last few years saying the, the actually the happiest people in America right now are between 65 and 80. That people come to terms with their life, they're more accepting, they're less anxious, less fear of missing out, that the mind actually becomes more cognitively complex. You know, when you and I were 15, if we'd be having a discussion about this, it would be a pretty simple-minded exercise. Now we're sort of grown-ups. You and I could probably go into some interesting territories because our minds, we've seen and done and felt a lot in our lives. So some people are arguing that the mind, the older mind, not the diseased older mind, but the older mind, is quite a miracle, it's quite a wonderful thing to behold. Then within these dementias, you've got Alzheimer's. People say it may be 50 or 60 percent of all the dementias. And at least what I've seen is that while I'd like to say that, oh, you can beat Alzheimer's by doing crossword puzzles or by having a, you know, a complex carbohydrate, lots of grain in your diet, I don't think so. Um, Here's my, the way I think about it, Hack. When I was 30, I collaborated on a book with Jonas Salk, my second book. And um, one night over dinner, I, I, had, I didn't know him well, and he was, you know, he's a titan of a guy because of having had his Salk vaccine breakthrough in 1953. He explained to me that in the 1940s, before we were born, poliomyelitis was rampant. And people didn't quite understand how it worked. And so there was a feeling that you caught it from people. You, if you touch strangers, don't ever touch a stranger. Don't swim in a public swimming pool during the summer because you'll catch polio. If somebody's sweating, don't let the sweat land on Nobody knew what was going on. And there was the belief that in the future, we're going to need millions of iron lungs. The polio, you can't stop it, so we just have to put people in iron lungs. And maybe some of your listeners don't even know what that is. It's like a coffin that you laid in and it breathed, you know, and you laid there and you had a mirror and that's how you lived the rest of your life. Salk said to me, you know, Ken, I had a totally different point of view. My point of view was we got to stop this goddamn thing. We got to end this disease. We got to turn it off. And luckily he and then Saban had their breakthroughs in the early 50s and you don't see polio so much anymore. Alzheimer's. I think Alzheimer's got to be beaten in the lab. I think Alzheimer's gonna have to be beat by science. Um, I, 
My mom uh, got eaten up uh, and taken down by Alzheimer's. I knew President Reagan. The guy surely had an interesting life. He surely had access to good medical care. He got eaten up by Alzheimer's. Margaret Thatcher got eaten up by Alzheimer's. You know, who's the guy who was on the Carol Barnett show, Tim, whatever, that's just announced last week he's got Alzheimer's. Truth of it is that over the age of 85 right now, one in three people have Alzheimer's. Over the age of 90, it's one in two. You're gonna have to filter this probably. This is a disease. Is it? disease. This disease could be the sinkhole into which this century falls because we're getting better and better and better at keeping people alive longer and longer and longer. But un unless we can wipe this disease out, we're heading for a zombie zone. So there are many of us in the field who are saying, you know, this is not about we need to be more kind and careful for caregivers. We need to be because uh, being a loving caregiver is a saintly task and role. We have to beef up our scientific creativity and imagination to turn this disease off. If we could do that, if we could somehow create a world without Alzheimer's, we'll be having another discussion when we're 100 years old. And it'll be an interesting discussion. And we're going to remember everything we're talking about today, and we're going to be talking about great grandkids and the contributions we've made to the world. I did a piece for the Harvard Business Review uh, about a decade ago. And I, I'm not that good a writer, but I got lucky and they accepted it. And, and I won the McKinsey Prize that year. And they called me up, they said it was the best article of the year, but you've tied for first place. I said, that's okay, who did I tie with? And they said, 96-year-old Peter Drucker, who was the founder of modern management science. So Mr. Drucker and I had to go to the banquet together. And I'm thinking to myself, man, this guy is 96, he's done more since he was 65 than most of the rest of us will do in a lifetime. If we can imagine a world without Alzheimer's, we're going to see, first of all, intact families because caregiving can bust up a family and damage relationships. We're going to see people with more financial well-being because dementia and diseases of the aging brain can unravel a family's life savings. We're going to see the ability to have the dream of history. Five, six, seven generations alive at the same time, all interacting, all contributing, all making sense of what the future could be. So there's a big job there, and that is to, first of all, back to your core question, we got to get a little better at understanding how the brain works as we age. Because even among the best of the best, it's not terribly sharp right now. But as I'm learning, there's different conditions, and each one may be responsive to different kind of either treatment or prevention or therapy. What my wife and I, her mom also was taken down with Alzheimer's. Our point of view is while we're hoping and trying to activate a cure, we try to be really careful in what we eat. We try to keep our exercise levels strong. We try to keep our, in other words, we try to do the three or four or five right things that everybody tells you will help avert these kinds of brain changes in aging. Ken Dykewald, tell us about your latest projects and projects coming up and what's going on now because you've got so many books and documentaries and awards, but tell us about your latest projects. Well, I'd say uh, there's a few things going on. Um, one that you might find interesting, and maybe your, your listeners uh, and audience would, would find interesting, is that I'm like a, um, I'm sort of a little bit of a renegade guy. I've never been a good bureaucrat. I've never sort of swum up the center of the highway. I've always done things a little bit my own way. and. Um, I was getting really, 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 really frustrated with the slow pace of science, you know, particularly regarding Alzheimer's, which I think is the looming challenge of this century. Not because a few people are going to have it, it's because kind of like everybody's going to have it. I would also tell you that in California where I live, all these billionaire characters, they're all trying to figure out a way to live forever but they all know that you might be able to slow down your aging rate or you might be able to you know, fix your kidneys or something, but I'll tell you what, if you don't beat Alzheimer's disease, <laughs> that's not the future you want. So I heard about this thing called the X Prize, 
It was started over a decade ago by a physician named Peter Diamandis. Peter's um, in his 50s, uh, undergraduate and graduate degrees in astrophysics and molecular biology at MIT while getting his MD at Harvard. He's one of those guys. Peter and Elon Musk and Craig Venter and Dean Kamen, there's like this crew of these characters. So I hear, heard that I was going to be speaking at a conference actually in Miami. Uh, and Peter DeMontis was going to be the speaker after me. So I kind of cleverly or whatever, I said to the conference planner, there's about a thousand people in the audience. I said, look, I'd like to go before DeMontis. I'd like to, have, to insist that DeMontis be in the room during my session. And then I'd like to have he and I on the stage for an hour afterward. No extra charge. Why? Because Peter believes that the grand challenges of the world can be solved by going outside the box. He first tried that out, having been a young man interested in space, he was taken by the Lindbergh flight. And he realized that Lindbergh did that flight as part of a, a competition, and there was an award. And by flying that distance, he won an award, and then all of a sudden space travel, I mean, air travel just took off. So Peter said, you know, I'd like to create a competition to see who can create a vehicle that'll go 100 kilometers into space, man vehicle, back to the Earth, and a week later do it again, no injuries. And he boldly announced to the world that he was going to pay the winner who could do that $10 million. He didn't have $10 million. All of a sudden, all over the world, people like to, it's what's called gamification, people like to play. So people were coming up with helium balloons and helicopters and rocket ships and airplanes. And, and he went to you know, people like um, Branson, Richard Branson, said, how'd you like to fund this? I could use the $10, $10 million. Branson says, no, man, what if somebody goes up there and blows up or gets killed? Terrible. Turns out he ultimately did get $10 million from the Ansari family, a, a, a family of um, Iranians, Americans who were very successful in tech. And a guy named Bert Rutan created this plane-type vehicle, went up, came down, and did it. And the next day, uh, Richard Branson bought his company. And now SpaceX has come from that, and space travel. I mean, all this commercialization of, of space, is Elon Musk's businesses, all grew out of that. And so since then, Peter has been creating, been creating grand challenges for all sorts of things. He did one, he put a grand challenge out that um, Wendy Schmidt funded. She's the wife of the founder of Google. And the idea was to who could clean up oil sludge out of the ocean. And Peter's belief is you go to the usual experts, and they're so used to thinking about things the same way, they may not see some other angle. The guys that took a second place for that award were two guys that ran a tattoo parlor in Las Vegas. <laughs> and they had never actually been to the ocean, but they used to be cement mixers. So they had a feeling for how to work with sludge. And that's what's happening with all of these X prizes that high school kids compete and mad scientists in India compete and crazy professors in China jump in. And so I, back, here we are six years ago, I'm on the stage, thousand people, Demonis is in the audience, and I said at one point, hey, this age wave thing that's coming is really great. And man, the possibilities are just like a dream. However, uh, I don't know where you are in this audience, Peter Diamandis, but if you're so smart, why don't you create an X prize to wipe Alzheimer's out? I didn't know that his father also was being taken down by Alzheimer's. Well, the room got very quiet. Like, imagine yourself at a fight, you know? All of a sudden, it's like, wait a minute. The, that guy on the stage just call out the next speaker? I did. The okay. came up and did his speech, and he couldn't, you know, there's an elephant in the room, and he said, all right, so, okay, I've been challenged here. Dykewald, come on up here, let's figure this out. And so live on stage, we figured out how we were going to create an X-Prize to end Alzheimer's disease. And so for the last six years, with a group of some of the world's greatest scientists and hackers and... Um, gamers and data miners. So we're not just looking for neuroscientists. We're about to, and we raised $25 million. We're about to launch early next year for the world, a crowdsourced solution to being able to target Alzheimer's before their symptoms so it can be turned off. We may fail. 
but we're going to give it our best shot. So I'm pretty proud of working on that one. There's no money involved for me. I've been partially funding it, and um, it's pretty exciting, you know. The, uh, I'll, I'll tell you this one thing, partly what inspired it, a few years ago my wife and I got caught in Sweden. We didn't get caught, Sweden's great, but it, we got caught on a rainy day in Sweden and we were walking around umbrellas and we wandered into the Nobel Museum, which I didn't even know was there. And you know, there's the usual pictures of Nobel Prize winners, but they had a little screening room. And we went in it and there was a documentary being screened on a big TV monitor. Uh, it, it was sort of an interview with a Nobel Prize winner and how he had his breakthrough. And it wasn't a straight line. He went to graduate school, he knew he was gonna do this. It was his wife kicked him in the head and he met another person and they had an argument and his nose ran and I mean, it was all these crazy things. That's what led to breakthrough. And when it was over, my wife and I said, wow, that was wild. And we got up to leave and another one came on. We spent the whole day watching how these breakthroughs had happened and they almost always come from serendipity and crossover and you know an orthopedic guy looking at the brain and you know interventional cardiology did not come from a cardiologist came from a physicist you know things happen so what we're going to try to do is unleash this kind of creativity and imagination to try to solve to use our best minds to try to save our minds Ken Dykewald, how can people find out more about you? Um, our company's website is www.agewave.com, and that's a portal that can take you into all the different things we do and that we're involved with. What have we not spoken about that you'd like to talk about? Would you like to talk about some of your books, documentaries, yeah. projects? Um, I don't need to promote books. I, uh, I got something I'd like to talk about for a few minutes. So we haven't seen each other since we were 15. Uh, you've looked at my life, I've looked at your life. <laughs> what scares you about getting older? And I'll tell you what scares me. Um, I would be so happy at this age of 68 if I didn't feel I was getting closer to death. And um, otherwise I, I feel really great. I'm. I feel stressed out because I want to make sure everything's in order for when I do go, you know, uh, mm -hmm. you know, your daughter, your loved ones, you mm -hmm. know, make sure everything's good. But, um, and I'm, I feel that I'm not performing up to my potential to get good stuff done. That's how I feel. Do you feel like a senior citizen? No. <laughs> <laughs> Do you feel old? No. All right, so let me take a shot at the same question. Um, I don't ever want to be a senior citizen, and I have a lot of respect for senior citizens, but to me that's like, I have this thing in my head, that's what my grandma was. Um, I wouldn't mind being thought of as an elder. I like that. I, I'm okay with that word. Um, I also feel a certain amount of anxiety and pressure. Am I doing it right? Am I living up to my potential? And um, it's eerie because I thought when I reached this age, I'd be ready to kind of, you know, take the cruise and kick back. But while I want to have more time to play, I really do find that I feel more driven in some ways than I ever have before. What frightens me? I'm frightened by suffering. I, um, Watch my mom, you know, transition from being a beautiful woman and a dancer to wheelchair and diapers and my dad lost his vision and sort of lost his mind a little bit at the end and the suffering of uh, aging. It used to be, you know, as you know, people got sick, they died or you got, you know, died in childbirth or you had you got shot and you were dead, you know. Now there's this, I've seen enough of people who are going through these horrific years, decades of suffering, uh, that frightens me, uh, both for me and for my family. And I kind of like, you know, this, this idea of uh, living a full, loving, productive life and then lights out is more appealing to me than being in some kind of an institution for years. You know. 
And so what you have done is you are creating positive tools. You're walking the walk. You're much more than talking the talk. And for you to do everything you've done and continue to do it in such a positive, energetic way, notice that I've corrected my behavior. <laughs> <laughs> Not well, youthful. See, I'm, I'm okay with youthful. Young is different. But youthful is okay. But I wanted to tap you on that one just a little no, bit. But energetic good. is good. Positive, energetic, wonderful. Thank you so much for being with us today. It's been an honor and a pleasure. And I want to tell you, my friend, that it's an honor just to be here in the space with you and, and have this kind of discussion. No shit. I mean, it's just great to be with you. Thank you. All right. Exploring Different Brains is a production of Different Brains, Inc. For more information, visit us at differentbrains.org.